there's going to be a lot of bonus material. And as I, you know, as you know, or most of you know, I'm from Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm, uh, for 30 years, I was a reporter at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and was working on a story on violence on television and how it affects children. A colleague suggests that I interview Captain Kangaroo and Mr. Rogers. So I pick up the phone, tell the necessary people, phone rings, it's Captain Kangaroo. October of 1995. He's a great guy, we had a long conversation, hang up, and literally within the hour, the phone rings again. And this is my single greatest feat in journalism, talking to Captain Kangaroo and Mr. Rogers on the same day. And it's that voice at the other, other end of the line that said, well, hello, Tim. This is Fred Rogers calling from Pittsburgh. And then at the end of a long and very meaningful conversation, very candid about his career and what he thought was past for you know, the crap he saw on television, uh, the past for children's programming, he said to me, you know, and again, the context escapes me, you know what the most important thing in my life is right now? And I say, Mr. Rogers, you know, come on, we just met. And he said, speaking to Mr. Tim Madigan on the telephone. And therein lies, is a hint of, the foundation of his human greatness, his ability to be present. You know, because when he was with you, he was with you. And am I the only one in this room that for me to be present, I, I have to consciously remind myself to be present most of the time. And uh, it takes discipline on my part and practice. And one of the reasons I love doing this is because it reminds me of that, you know, that sort of thing. But he embodied that. He was, he was that presence. Take in anything that another person would want to, want to share. And his Holy Spirit was, uh, I, could, I couldn't say holy pure, but as uncontaminated by human ego agenda and preoccupation as any person that I've ever met, and few people on the planet who've ever walked the planet. So he would respond from this place, from this place of spirit, with wisdom, compassion, love, and never judgment. So he invited me, uh, that, that conversation went well enough that he invited me to Pittsburgh. I spent four days with him to research a profile in Fred himself. And unashamed insistence on intimacy that began from the first time we sat down together. Uh, he, has this, he has this office, a little, little, very modest little office, or he had this very modest little office in the public television station in Pittsburgh. And we talked for a long time about this and that. But a month before I was there, he had lost his best friend. When Fred was in junior high, he was pudgy, shy, and musical. And guess what happens to kids who are pudgy, shy, and musical? One day when he's walking home, a bunch of bullies followed him and said, we're gonna get you, Fat Freddy, we're gonna get you, Fat Freddy. Till Fred ran through the front door of his home in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. You know what the adults said? Just ignore him. Get over it. Pretend like it doesn't bother you, then they'll leave you alone. Even as a ninth or an eighth grader, Fred had the insight to know, what the heck with that? I'm angry. I'm sad and I'm hurt. And I'm, you know, and I'm going to cry and I'm going to pound, I'm going to express my anger on the keys of the piano by pounding extra hard on the keys. So, and then from that point on, it, he said that my mission on life became others like me. 
I'm wanting to know what it was about them that didn't meet the eye. So anyway, that's Fred as an eighth grader. Ninth grade, this guy named Jim Stumbaugh, president of the class, quarterback, big man on campus, breaks his leg playing football, and Fred volunteers to bring uh, his books to him to the hospital. And as they did over the course of this time, the two of them became friends. And Stumbaugh let it became known that anybody who messed with Fred Rogers was going to have to deal with him. And, and Jim started to include Fred in all the things that, as Fred said, he thought I might be interested in. Fred said that relationship, as much as anything, changed his life. That Jim Stumbaugh, this cool guy, showed that kind of confidence in him. And it just by the time Fred was a senior in high school, he was president of the yearbook and doing all these great things and on the road to becoming Mr. Rogers. But Simba had died the month before I'd been there. So Fred's telling me this. It was a beautiful autumn day and sunny outside, and Fred was telling me this. And then he turns to me and he said, uh, or he, one of the, he turns to me and he says, uh, you're ministering to me, Tim. By listening, you're ministering to me. I had a tape recorder going. I was a reporter on assignment. That didn't matter to him. There was no, it was one human being talking to another. And I have to think that in many respects, that's where our friendship began. So anyway, uh, it was a, remark a remarkable time. And uh, I had interviewed him several times, watched him film a program. Um, it's a lot of stuff in the book about you know, that, that time I spent with him. Uh, my last interview with him was on a Saturday morning. I went back to my hotel. I was going to fly back to Texas uh, the following Sunday afternoon. I thought my time was done with him, regrettably. But it was like, holy crap. I've never seen anything like this before. I watched him bestow this presence on people. Where, you know, whether it was wherever, wherever he went. But anyway, I get in my hotel room, the phone rings. And it's, well, hello, Tim. This is Fred Rogers. And he says, if you're not too busy tomorrow, would you like to join my family and me for church? I go, I'm like, yeah. I love coming to church with you, but he, it was way more cool to go to church with Fred Rogers. <laughs> Fair enough, right? Uh, anyway, so I did. I mean, I went to this Presbyterian church in Squirrel Hill, the same neighborhood where that terrible thing happened in that synagogue a few weeks ago. Uh, and he introduces me to his friends and his wife and his pastor and he had, you know, and his wife is in the choir so it was just Fred and I in this pew towards the front of the church and he had his two young grandkids with him and we're singing hymns and doing everything and it's just great and then the minister gets to the point in the, in the service when he asks his congregation to share their joys and concerns and so, so someone says, talks about so-and-so's got cancer, there's a new baby, a new job, the kind of the familiar litany that... And the last woman to speak <clears throat> was standing in the rear of the church, and I desperately wanted to turn around and look at her because she was clearly crazy. She launched into this long and deranged and embarrassing not you know disjointed diatribe against war you just went on and on and on and on and you could just sense the mortification rising in the sanctuary including from yours truly i was embarrassed for them who let her in and you could almost hear the poor minister standing at the pulpit thinking what tactful thing can I possibly say to get this woman to sit down and be quiet? Well, finally, she did. And, oh, God, including me. So 
The one exception was the guy sitting next to me who leaned over and whispered in, in my ear, that poor dear. Don't you know at some, some point in that woman's life, she suffered terribly because of war. And then at the end of the service, when she was being ostracized, it was Fred and Fred alone who went up to her and took her in his arms and spent as long as she wanted to talk, listening to whatever it was about war that caused her such pain, whether it made sense or not. Because to Fred Rogers, the only thing that mattered was what made sense to her. I think that's my opinion, that's what human greatness looks like. That was the way he lived. Never judging, always wondering what is beneath the surface? Where's that pain coming from? Boy, I don't have time living. So he walks me to my car that day, hugs, gives me a hug, tells me he's glad to be my friend. I get home, my wife says, there's something you need to hear. And it's his voice on our, then, you know, everybody had answering machines at the time, and it's a hello, Catherine. I just wanted to thank you for sharing your husband with those of us in our neighborhood. He could be such a nerd. He could only, he could get away with something like that. So anyway, Mr. Rogers wants to be my friend. What? I'm, I'm, but I'm kind of like Tim in this way. Okay, he wants to be my friend. So I started to write to him. You want to be my friend? You're going to be my friend. I started to write to him. Sending him stories I was proud of. And it occurred to me that I was seeking his affirmation even then. Uh, but they're relatively superficial, right? But as many of you, many of you have heard, um, on the wall of his office is a quote from the Little Prince. What is essential is invisible to the eye. So he wanted to know about your essential invisibles. Anything mentionable is manageable. Anything, anything, anything mentionable as manageable. And Henry Nouwen, the great Catholic writer who's a close friend of Fred's, said, that which is most personal is most universal. Which I've interpreted to mean, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, what is most personal? What is it that we try to most conceal from one another? Is it the things we're happy about, proud of? Is it my depression? Is it my fear? Is it my sadness? Is it my shame? Not telling you that. I suspect that there are a lot of people in this room who have some experience with these things, of feeling these feelings. And Shakespeare said something to the effect of, we're all such great actors. Him and I have been talking about the mask. The mask is important. I don't want to go into the clerk at 7-Eleven and say, you know, I'm really depressed. The mask needs to be there sometimes. The problem is, is that when we keep it on, the people who are closest to us, the people for whom we can trust. So anyway, and, and Fred just very kind of gently and very gradually, tell me. Maybe he sensed that there was something going on with me. Or maybe he knew that there's something going on with everybody. 
so at, after six months, I wrote him this letter. Dear Fred, I really, you know, I'm really glad we're friends, but if we're going to be friends, I think you'd be the first to agree that you need to know the truth of my life. So I shared all these things with him. And, and at the heart of everything, Fred, is this haunting sense that all my life I've been trying to get my father to be proud of me. And nothing's ever seemed to work. So, Fred, I have a question to ask you. Would you be proud of me? Hold it up, flick the stamp, put an envelope, send it away. July 1st, 1996. Dear Tim, the answer to your question is yes, in capital letters, exc exclamation points, or resounding yes. I will be proud of you. I am proud of you. I have been proud of you since first we met. And then, of course, someone actually said this to me. Well, he was, what did what'd you expect him to say? No. But, but it's what came next that I think that was remarkable. Because he said nothing, or he said, I, first he said, I'm deeply touched that you, care, that you care to share so much of yourself with me. And look forward to hearing all that you care to share in the future. And I know that for a fact, because anytime Fred would, or someone would do that with Fred, it was like, it's like he was being trusted for the first time. He had the unique capacity for awe. You know, in these in these sacred moments of life. And he said, Nothing could nothing could change my yes for you. Please remember that. Your place in this life is unique, absolutely unique. You know how special you really are. Only God can arrange a mutually trusting friends. Yes, Tim, yes. Love, Fred. And then for the rest of our correspondence, he signed off. IPOI. I'm proud of you. And I don't know if I've said it at all the services, but I've gotten a lot of mail from all over the world since this book was published. And many people have said, you know, Tim, I know those letters are written to you but it feels like they were written to me too, because I've been depressed, I've lost someone I've loved. I've... And then, you know, and then it was a joy, you know, I'm so happy, I would reply, I said, he was writing to you. You know, in so many senses, I was just the middle man. Because if any of you would have written that letter or been in that place and he would have responded in the same way, not because that's how Mr. Rogers was expected to ask, was because from this spirit of his would come this unconditional love and wisdom. And so nothing you could tell me could change my yes for you. And then a year and a half later, I told my wife I was going to find a separation. We had been struggling for a long time. Figured it must be her. God knows it couldn't be me. That was in therapy. <laughs> so I'm putting up Christmas lights thinking, how am I gonna tell how am I gonna tell Fred Rogers I'm getting ready to leave my wife? You know, this guy that had devoted his life to children and families. And so after the lights, I go in and tears are streaming down my face. And dear Fred, I really hate to have to tell you this, but this is what's going on in my house right now. Could you be proud of a man like this? I put it up, took the stamp, mailed it away. His reply came a few days later, which said, dear Tim, please know I will never forsake you. I will never stop loving you. I will always be proud of you. If only, if only we lived closer, I would drive to your house and knock on your door, and when you answered, I would take you into my arms and hug you tight. King 
kingdom of God is for the brokenhearted. Convinced, more convinced than ever that fewer and fewer people in this life can escape major suffering. And then he signed off by saying, you are my beloved brother, Tim. You are God's beloved son. After I just told my wife I wanted to leave her. A few weeks later, as many of you know, I wrote, her, wrote another letter. I went away to the mountains in New Mexico, got a cheap cabin. Realized, you know, that, that the problem in my marriage was the guy looking at me in the mirror. And so, with my tail between my legs, I went home and So January 27th, it'll be 29 years. So I wrote Fred a letter said, we're not going to separate. And, and he wrote back saying, oh, thank God. You know, I'm sure his heart was broken. To hear that my, that my family was about to end. And his heart broke. When difficult things happened, his heart broke. He told me about some things happening in his family that he's really struggled with. He was human. Uh, but the, when I wrote him that letter, the only thing that mattered to him was that I was in pain. That's all. Try to problem solve, and he just said, just know that I would never forsake you. Has my marriage survived because of that? You know, again, Tim asked me over the weekend, this, these interactions, was it like angels descending and Hollywood riding off into the sunset? I don't care. I don't care. But I, I can't help but believing the world would be a much different place if that's how more of us responded to one another. So, you've heard that, that part, most of you. This you haven't heard, probably few weeks uh, or a short period of time after the I'm proud of you letter, he wrote me another one and said, this is what has been opened up for me this weekend. I'm going to try to make it through. No guarantees. He said, tell me about your dad. What was his childhood like? I said, I don't know. I've never asked. So I started to ask. One particular moment came back to me this weekend that I hadn't thought about in a long time. We were driving down the street in this little town in western North Dakota where I grew up, visiting. And as part of my inquiries, I asked him this question. How many times did your mom and dad watch you come play sports? Without a beat, he said twice. He was a star athlete in high school. His father never came to see him play. His mother came twice. Boom, twice. Had been sitting at the top of his soul for 50 years. My dad suffered from depression. And he had a very hard time expressing 
what I needed to hear from him. But he never missed a game. Never missed a game. No matter what. Home or away. Sometimes he didn't like the way I played. And he never really said anything. He just kind of shook his head. And that went, oh. But he never missed a game. And all of a sudden, I started asking him these questions, and I realized he was suffered from depression before there was any depressants. And before it was cool for men to go to therapy. And he just... He just dealt with it. He got up every morning, went to work, worked 12-hour day, supported a family of nine, was faithful to my wife. Most days during the summer, he's available for a game of catch. He was known as one of the most honest businessmen in this little town where I grew up. Another one of my favorite Fredisms is this. It's much easier to love someone if you know their story. Once I learned my dad's story, it changed everything. He gave me so much more than his father had given him. And does that mean I apologize for my wound? No. But little by little, what started to kind of edge into that hurt space was compassion and understanding and realizing that my dad was not this man from the top of the mountain. He was just a man, a struggling man. book is dedicated to him. And one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is send him the manuscript before it was published because I, to write this book, I had to be honest about that relationship. And he read it, and he looked at my mom, and he said, I didn't beat him, did I? Uh, and, and then when the first book events I did was in St. Paul, and there were my family sitting on the front row, and I said, uh, you know, my dad is an amazing man, but, you know, guys like him just don't, aren't in the headlines. You know, they don't get the, they don't get the recognition they deserve. All they do every day is do the right thing. So uh, tonight I want to change that. I want, I want you to give my dad a standing ovation, and in doing so you'll recognize other other people like him. So pfft, hundreds of people just stood and took the roof off the place. And my dad, to his credit, milked it. And he, he gave and he gave it one of these. <laughs> <just all. laughs> and I asked him, I said afterwards said afterwards, what do you think about that? He says, well, I've never had a standing ovation before. Uh, he died of Alzheimer's seven or eight years ago. Well into the disease one day in St. Paul, living with my sister. It was a snowy day outside. winter and we're, he and I were sitting together because at that point you know you wanted to be close and he said something that was lucid and he turns to me and he said may God bless you and there's something you know that seemed to be the words that I was waiting for May 
got up and I walked through the snow to Starbucks crying my eyes out all the time. By the time he died. All I felt was the purest form of sorrow. In the men's group, maybe one of the guys are here today, we're talking about grieving and about fathers and grieving and a couple of, a couple of guys said, you know, in this grief book that we wrote, there's an example of a, a guy who had adored his dad and lost him to, suddenly to a heart attack. And you know, this guy was just devastated. And, and these, these, old, these older guys said, you know, I, feel this, I felt the same way about my dad as that guy did in the book. I just worshipped him. And he said, you know, they've been get, gone, dead a long time. And he said, I'm still sad. You know, part of the me me message of the grief book is that, you know, that's hallelujah for that. And this guy said, no, I'll never forget it. I'm glad to be sad. So I thought that with, with regards to my dad all weekend, I'm glad to be sad. God, what are you doing to me? Um, there's a movie coming out next year with Tom Hanks playing Fred. And uh, that project originated with my book. Uh, these two young screenwriters wrote a beautiful script based on I'm Proud of You and they got it into a production company and they got a big name directors attached and there's tons of buzz in Hollywood. And uh, and then at the last minute, uh, Fred's people, and this is long after Fred was dead, Fred's people said, pull the plug on it, pull the plug on it. And the explanation I was given was that the script was too much about me and not enough about Fred. Ouch. And you know, Bradley Cooper is Tim Madigan. You can kind of see it, right? <laughs> Remember, I was a much younger man at the time. Uh, but as time passed, I came to, I came to, uh, I came to, they were right. Because, uh, and the other thing I'll say is that this was all going on in 2013. That's not when we need a movie about Fred Rogers. We need a movie about Fred Rogers now. So they went back to the drawing board and came up with another script, and Tom Hanks is going to do his thing. But, but the original script, and I'm going to close with this, was had something to do with the story uh, you know, I'm about to tell you now. My brother Steve was a year younger than me. And in our little town in uh, Minnesota, it was said that Tim and Steve were one word. He was the yang to my yang. And we shared a room, and some of the most sacred memories of my boyhood are us, the two of us, lying together late at night talking. He was, oh, it was, Played first while I was pitching. He was a forward when I was a defenseman in hockey. You know, just I don't think any two brothers could have ever been closer. And then we went to college and went went off into the world. And he went one way and I went another. And by the early probably early 1990s, yeah, it was the early 1990s. We became estranged. We never talked. It's a long story. I Anyway, one day after I'd met Fred, uh, I get a call from my mom, and she tells me Steve's, Steve's got advanced lung cancer. So I'm thinking, oh, cancer's not a good thing. So 
but hang on, what do I do? I haven't, I haven't, I haven't talked to him in five years. First, first person I called was my wife. Second person I called was Fred. And there was Joanne that answered the phone and his wife, and then we had this long conversation. And so anyway, you know, I said, I got to suck it up and go to Davenport, Iowa, where we live. And, but an, an amazing thing happened. He was kind of a touch by an angel thing. You know, Fred called my issues the Furies. Steve had Furies times 10. It was just a mess. I always thinking that the next business deal or the next wife was going to try to calm his soul. And it was just spinning faster and faster and faster and smoking and smoking and smoking. And then after he got sick, boom, everything changed. It's like, he said, it was, he said it was like someone opened a window and all that stuff just flew out. And he and I reconnected and got close again. And he said, said to me once, isn't it crazy that it was his cancer that brought us back together? And this is the little things. He would say, shh. He said, Cardinal. He never would have known. His first, his first taste of coffee in the morning was like a religious experience. Mm, that's good. Changes, you know, saved his marriage, changed the way he parented his two young boys. So I call Fred and I tell him this. And uh, Fred says, Steve is teaching us all now. So one day, about two weeks before he died, he was paralyzed from the chest down and he had a hospital bed in his in the hospice care and he had a hospital bed in his living room in Davenport and we were all there <coughs> and uh, the phone rings my mom answers it well, hello this is Fred Rogers calling from Pittsburgh is this Mrs. Madigan oh yes it is Mrs. Madigan oh my god it's Fred Rogers Oh, it's so nice to meet you, et cetera, et cetera. And she says, are you calling for Tim? And I said, he said, no, I want to talk to Steve. So she runs the phone upstairs and says, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers. Hands the phone to Steve. Steve says, hey, Fred. By then he was kind of over this whole celebrity thing, I guess. And they have this long conversation and Steve tells Fred that the cancer is the best thing that ever happened to him. Paralyzed from the chest down, getting ready to leave a young family. And knowing Fred as I do, that at the other end of the line, he was, Fred was doing backflips. Because he knew that through this disease, Steve had discovered kind of the, his uh, essential invisibles. Or he, he enjoyed that knowledge for too short a time, but he did. And then Fred did something that, there are a couple of examples of this in the book. He asked my brother to pray for him. He asked my brother to pray for him. Why could that possibly be? This is why. Fred believed that anyone who had suffered as my brother had suffered must be extremely close to God. 
Therefore, he genuinely wanted Steve's intercession in his life. And for the two weeks that Steve lived, he got it. There's something about this whole thing that's beyond words. Right? You know, these words can kind of point in a certain direction. But they can never really fully explain the mystery of grace and love. And uh, and one of the, my little theology that emerged from this is that God was not in the cancer, but God was in the grace of that phone call. God was in the loving kindness that our family showed from one for one another, and the loving kindness of friends, and and that you know, and one of the things I say is. God, this is really hard. That's terrible. But don't miss the grace notes. In the midst of the suffering, don't miss the grace notes. There are so many for us. Well, on a, on a early one morning, uh, I was taking my turn, my turn at the vigil, and I saw my brother raise up like he was scoring a goal. By the time he lowered his his arms, his breathing had changed, and I knew that the time had come. Got the family together. And and I told him, I held his hand and told him to go be with the angels. The most, one of the worst moments because we were, we thought we were prepared. I'm not sure you ever can be, for the for the sense of absence that I felt immediately after his spirit had left his body. But anyway, called Fred. Told him what had happened. That night, an email shows up at Steve's home, addressed to me. Dear Tim, After a long day at work, I came home and told Joanne about Steve. We talked about you all during dinner. Joanne sends her love to you, too. As usual, I went for my after-dinner walk in the park near my apartment. It was near sunset and a gorgeous one it was. On my way back, there was the most beautiful cloud formation, illuminated by the last bit of setting sun. Said Tim, there are no adequate words for such beauty. At any rate, all I could think of saying was, thank you. So I did. And I prayed for you and your wonderful family gathered in such common purpose there in Iowa. It wasn't long before something said to me, look up. Well, I did, and there in a completely clear patch of sky was the brightest new moon I had ever seen. It looked like a special apostrophe in the sky. And I thought, yep, it's Steve's for sure. Just wanted you to know that you're all in our hearts more than ever. IPOI as always, Fred.
deal with. Make a conscious effort to let what's going on in this room right now enter into your souls. It's amazing. In this moment, I believe that we are living in a place beyond death. We are living in a place beyond suffering. That in this silence, in these tears, we're touching the eternal. never forget this moment. I haven't told this story about my father and my brother in years. We can't, you know. And Fred is here. Fred is here. And he's saying, this is, this is, kind of what I'm talking about. Can we take it with us? Let's be honest. It's not easy to take this with us out there. But I think we can come back to it. Come back to it. Sundays you come here and listen to him. And come back to it by the time you spend each day in the conversation. You can come back to it. When you have an opportunity to say, don't you know that at some point in that woman's life she suffered terribly because of her? Rather than to say, Ugh. when you when you say, in the midst of the furies, in the midst of the push and pull of life and the tragedy and stuff, you say, I will never forsake. That's bold. Fred used those words. He knew they were in the Bible. That's bold. But, but again, I just think that it's in this moment lies not the truth, something that points to it. In Fred's name, Jesus name touch my heart more than I could ever describe God bless each and every one of you